Hey everyone, before we jump into this premiere episode of the Book Owl podcast, let me just start by offering up a little apology for a few quirky bits of editing and maybe some sound quality issues. Hopefully you can be a little bit forgiving and look past these foibles and enjoy the episode. All right, on to the theme music and on to the episode. Hey everyone, this is Tammy Painter and you're listening to the Book Owl podcast, the podcast where I entertain your inner book nerd with tales of quirky books and literary lore. And guess what? This is my very first show! In other words, bear with me, I'm just getting the hang of this. So as I record this, we are in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic and we are hearing daily, daily, okay, hourly, minutely, about things that will kill us. Which, of course, means you're eager to hear about something else that can kill you. Not a virus this time, but a book. So while I do want to introduce myself to you, I'm going to wait till the end of the show so we can jump right into this deadly mayhem. Now, if you tell someone, say your bungee jumping buddy, that your favorite hobby is reading, they probably look at you like, (laughs) wimp. Reading is something you do to relax. It's something you do from the safety of an armchair. It's about as far from bungee jumping danger as you can get. And it's rarely associated with causing bodily harm unless you're reading on your phone and you walk straight into a lamppost. But that's a whole nother topic. However, there is a book out there that can kill you. It won't kill you quickly. It will invade your body linger in there, and wreak havoc until you finally die. It's so dangerous, it's stored in a lead-lined box and you have to sign a waiver to see it. Should you disregard the rules and safety instructions when you go and actually do see the book, you risk burns, nausea, and even cancer. So who wrote this dangerous tome? Well, it was written by a headstrong woman who was very smart and who was celebrated in her lifetime. But being an intelligent woman who wanted to make her own career and have her own life, she was also scorned and shunned. Her name? Marie Curie. So Marie Curie was born Maria. I am going to screw up this pronunciation so badly, so please forgive me, everybody in Poland. Maria Sklodowska. She was born in Warsaw in 1867 and... Even when she was young, she couldn't be bothered with conventions that said women didn't need higher education. So she studied in the, I love this name, Flying University. And disappointingly, despite the name, it was not a flight school. It was actually a secret underground university in Russia. This served good enough for Marie's education for a time, but she eventually wanted a little more. She wanted something more official, so she went to finish her education in Paris, where they were a little bit more open to women studying. The trouble was that heading off to school to go study in Paris, as today, isn't the cheapest thing in the world. So to afford her education, I mean, this woman was dedicated. She basically just turned off all the heat in her apartment and would instead wear pretty much all of her clothing layered one on top of the the other just just to stay, you know, toasty. Marie, she was a big science nerd. She would get so obsessed with her studies of physics and chemistry that she would forget to eat. In Paris, where they have taste-tempting boulangeries everywhere. The mind boggles. Anyway, she eventually came to work in the lab of Pierre Curie. I know, her name is big spoiler alert, but let's just say these two not only shared a passion for science, but for each other. Pierre, there was no two ways around it. He was head over heels for Marie, and he wanted to marry her. But despite his devotion, despite his efforts to woo her, despite his proposing marriage to her, she just gave a flat out no. Since she really had no intention of staying in Paris, she figured what would be the point of hooking up with Pierre. Pierre, who seems to be rather romantic for a scientist, told her that he loved her so much that he would give up science and move to Poland with her. And yet this still didn't win Marie over. So what did eventually seal the deal? Because obviously we know they got married. Well, Marie did actually go home to Poland. She went basically to visit her family. And she found out that as a woman, 
she wasn't going to get a job in Poland in the career that she wanted. So she went back to Paris and she went back to Pierre. You do have to kind of wonder how Pierre felt about being, you know, second best. But, you know, they got together and they made it work and they actually, they like to ride bicycles together, which is kind of cute. Anyway, the two were eventually wed and you I have to set the scene because I just picture this in my head every time I read it. It wasn't a frills and fancy dress kind of thing. Marie didn't even have a wedding dress. She wore what she would normally wear to the lab. A dark blue dress, kind of formal looking. And rumor has it that they didn't even go on honeymoon. They just went from the ceremony back to the lab. So you can kind of picture these two urging the officiator to hurry up. They crank out their I do's. They look at each other for a sec. And then, you know, kind of with this agreement in both their eyes, they just dash back to the lab to keep on wor working. Honeymoon, moon. there's chemicals to be analyzed. And that's where we get back to that deadly book. It's actually not just one book, but a collection of books. These were Marie's lab journals and notebooks from her time, mostly in Pierre's lab, but even later on. Marie's studies tapped into her curiosity about the work being done on x-rays, which were really popular at the time. And she decided to study uranium and basically delve into how radiation works on a physical level. So when I did my own physics studies in college, we of course had some lessons on radiation. And that also included doing lab work. We were literally handed a piece of radioactive material and well, I don't really remember what we did with it during the experiment, but we did have to follow a lot of safety rules. And as a kid, I don't remember exactly what grade I was in, but my school took a field trip to the Hanford nuclear plant. Because, you know, what better way to educate growing minds and bodies than to expose them to radioactive material? But again, there were safety regulations. We all had to wear those little exposure meters, and we all had to follow some very strict rules. Not so much in Marie's days. There were no safety regulations because no one understood the danger of radiation. Uh, this was a time when young women worked in factories painting uranium directly onto watch faces to make the numbers or the hands of the watch glow in the dark. As you can imagine, picturing the size of a watch face, this was fine, delicate work, and to keep the paintbrushes with a, you know, a, a sharp tip on them, the ladies would lick, yes, lick the paintbrushes with the uranium on them to do this, you know, detail work. Needless to say, these ladies were not the healthiest lasses on the block. This was also a time of quack cures and fun stuff that tried to use science as a marketing tool. Not much different than today, right? People knew that certain materials like thorium radiated energy. And who doesn't want more energy, right? So if you could tout your product as bursting with energy, why not toss a little thorium into it? So thorium is a radioactive material. Nevertheless, it was being added into things like toothpaste, drinking cups, and uh, laxatives. <laughs> yeah, just for that little extra something. Anyway, so let's get back to Marie. She's every day in her lab handling uranium, polonium, and radium with no more concern than we would handle, say, a jug of Merlot. She'd even keep vials of the stuff in her pockets. I don't know if maybe she was overworked, but she would forget that they were there and she would wander home with them. Uh, can you imagine she's walking down the streets of Paris with radioactive material in her pockets? She wasn't worried a bit about the, you know, these materials. They, she even delighted in keeping the vials around the lab because in the dark, and I quote, the glowing tubes looked like fairy lights. Um, Yeah. Fairy lights of death. The good thing, though, is that Marie's haphazard ways with deadly substances weren't in vain. She coined the term radioactivity, and she ushered in the era of particle physics, uh, which is a big deal, even if you aren't a science nerd. 
She also won a couple Nobel Prizes. One was in physics, which she won with Pierre, and the second one was in chemistry. The problem was that when she and Pierre were awarded that first award, their heavy exposure to her fairy lights left both her and Pierre too ill to even go to the ceremony to celebrate the work she was doing with these deadly fairy lights. So I don't know if you classify that as irony or a wicked twist of fate, but, you know, either way, it's a not good. So three years after missing the Nobel Prize ceremony, Pierre died. And I know what you're thinking, but no, it was not radiation sickness. He was actually crushed under a horse-drawn cart. Which does make you wonder if the horse was being fed thorium-laden oats to boost his energy. Marie did mourn Pierre, but she also continued her work. She was living in a time when women were meant to stay home and raise the kids, and she was also working in a field that was mainly filled with men. As you can guess, she didn't have an easy time of things and was often shunned despite being super smart. Okay, except about safety things, but, you know, we'll, we'll let that slide. She didn't know. And these troubles didn't, you know, they weren't limited to her career side of life. Because after several years, Marie, she started a relationship with a former student of Pierre's named Paul. And even though he was estranged from his wife long before he ever hooked up with Marie, it was Marie who was labeled as the homewrecker. The tabloids were no different then than today, and they had a field day denigrating Marie. And the worst thing was, she wasn't even home at the time. She'd gone off to a conference in Belgium. And then when she returned, like, all these rumors had gone crazy. And she had to fight her way through an angry mob just to get into, I think she actually went to a friend's house. But Marie wasn't a woman to be held back by rumors. In that very same year where the angry mob was coming for her, she won her second Nobel Prize, which made her the very first person to win two Nobel Prizes. So, you know, go Marie. Surprisingly, despite all the radiation exposure and, you know, fairy light shenanigans, Marie did live to be 67 years old. Unlike Pierre, she didn't escape the effects of radiation poisoning and had been plagued with chronic illness most of her adult life. Basically, her passion for what she was studying would be the cause of her death. Marie now is recognized as one of the greatest scientists of her time, and I'm sure, like, even if you don't know anything about science, you've probably heard the name Marie Curie. And her notebooks contain a wealth of information and insight into the discoveries she made, and they're still important today. Unfortunately, as I said, they will kill you. However, you can still go see the books. They're kept in the Pierre and Marie Curie collection at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. To keep the radiation contained, the books live in lead-lined boxes, and no, you cannot check them out even if your fines are paid up. You can view them, however, provided you wear protective gear like a hazmat suit, and you also have to sign a liability waiver saying you aren't going to sue the library if you die for your curiosity. The crazy thing is, though, this protocol hasn't been in place that long. The notebooks were actually used by the Institute of Nuclear Physics until 1978. And this this institute wasn't somewhere off in, like, some, you know, research park or something. This was, like, literally in a neighborhood. So they kind of started noticing an unusually high cancer rate amongst the scientists and in the surrounding neighborhoods. Once the correlation between the radiation and the books and the cancer rates were made, well, the books were like most of us right now, put in lockdown. So that is it. I survived my first episode. If you enjoyed it, please leave a review or head to the bookowlpodcast.com to contact me and to let me know what you think. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. You can find all the links you need at the bookowlpodcast.com slash subscribe. Now, if you're interested, you can keep listening, or if you're not interested, you can just turn off now and go along your merry way. But here's a little bit about me. I'm a book nerd. I love books so much that after spending a decade as a scientist myself, I decided to write my own books. I've published two historical fantasy series, 
and I'm working on a humorous paranormal mystery. Still trying to nail down what exactly it is, but it is a trilogy. I've at least sorted that much out. Uh, anyway, if you want to learn more about me or about the podcast, just head to the about section of thebookowlpodcast.com. And if you want to support the show, consider purchasing one of my books. And you can find out about those at thebookowlpodcast.com slash books. All right. Thank you for listening, everyone. And I will hoot at you next time. The Book Owl Podcast is a production of Daisy Dog Media. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved. The theme music was created by Kevin Cloud. <laughs>